Thank you for listening to this week's message from Go Church. We hope it encourages you today. For more information about Go Church, check us out online at letsgo.church. We hope you enjoy today's message. All right, I'm curious today, how many of you are sports fans? Can I see hands in the air? You love sports, man. I love sports, yes? I'm in a friendly crowd today, man. I love sports. I was cheering so hard for the Avs to win game seven next year. But the Nuggets, can we bring it on up for the Nuggets? Yes? Come on. All the way to the championship win, finally, yes. I'm excited about that. So I grew up, I played sports. Becky, my wife, was great at sports. I was okay at sports. But we love to watch sports. So of course, Broncos, of course, Nuggets, of course, Avs, and some other things we watch. We actually live right over there by the Rapids Stadium, Dick's Sporting Goods, and that is soccer. Nothing against soccer. I'm just saying I did not grow up playing soccer. Now, how many of you played soccer growing up? We've got some soccer fans in here. Sure, yes. Lots and lots and lots of you. I still don't understand offsides or how some of this stuff works. I'm basically Ted Lasso is basically who I am. I'm like, (laughs) Ted Lasso. We can channel his spirit today. Your body is like old white race. If you don't warm it up properly... Something real bad could happen. (laughs) True that. (laughs) As you get older, definitely true that. So Becky and I, we we love sports. We love going to sporting events. So when my friend Zach, who used to be one of the GMs at the Colorado Rockies, invited me and Becky to come and to sit in his seats for the game, we were all about it. So we went, and let me tell you, I love going to a Rockies game, especially when the weather's amazing early in the season. But his seats where of course, so we get there and we're right behind home plate. And so just the pitch is coming in, man. You can see it, you can hear it into the mitt, you can hear the crack of that bat. I love going into the baseball stadium. It's like, I don't know why, but hot dogs just taste 10 times better at a baseball game, you know? It's like, I'll take seven, please, please. So we're there and we're having a great time. And my friend Zach comes down and he's just chatting with me and. We're talking about baseball, talking about life, having fun. Now, he's a GM, right, of the Rockies, and he asks me this question. He's like, hey, do you want to go take a look around? I'm like, you mean back there inside? He's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah. So he's like, come on. So I'm all excited, all giddy, you know. So we're going up the stairs, and I'm kind of walking fast, and we're walking towards this, like, super secret door, you know, during the game. We're like, bodyguards are posted by the door. You can't just go in. So I'm walking up and Zach's kind of right here behind me and they're looking at me and they're starting to be like, who are you? And then Zach comes right around and he's like, he's with me. And they're like, and then boom, door just opens. All Zach had to do, just come right around. He's with me. Boom, door wide open. So we go behind into the holy of holies of the Colorado Rockies. So we're back there and he's like, do you want to see the gym? Like, yeah. You want to see rehab facility? Yeah. What about the locker room? I'm like, yeah. So we start going into all these places. He's like, what about this? Boom, we're in. Locker room, we go in. There's players in there. It's kind of in between innings and meeting people. And it was fun. I'm like, well, what about your office? Could we go there? He's like, sure. We go up there and I'm like, what about the owner's office? He's like, Yes, we don't tell anybody. Sorry, this is online. Delete that. So we go into the owner's office. He's like, anywhere I wanted to go, if I was with Zach, that night the door just, boom, opened. Now think about how it would have been if I would have just decided to get up, take Becky, and say, you know what? Let's just go check out the Rockies behind the scenes. And we walk up to that first door with the bodyguards. You think we're getting in? Even if it were like, well, but I know a guy. Like, sure, everybody knows the guy. No. Do you have the lanyard of power? No, don't have that. Do you have the credentials? No, don't have that. Sorry, you're not getting in. I want you to think about this dynamic because it's exactly the same way in the kingdom of God. There could be doors that you desperately want to go into, but you can't do it. Not without the Lord with you. Just like Zach was with me that night, When the Lord is with you, there are doors in your life that will bust open, opportunities that he will provide, things that he will ask you to do that you could never do on your own. 
places that he wants you to go that you could never get to on your own. So I want you to begin to think about this today. Who are you doing God with? I was bold when I was with Zach. I mean, walking around like I owned the place with Zach. Without Zach, I'm getting tossed out, might be in jail overnight. Who are you doing life with? And what difference does it really make? Are you trying to do your career on your own, life on your own, parenting really on your own? Maybe you even come to church, read your Bible, but you don't even think about including God in your marketplace job. You don't pray about meetings you're going to have. You don't pray about strategic business decisions. You don't pray about the procedure that's coming up. It never even comes into your mind. You just think, well, that's just me. God is just some kind of event on a Sunday or a thing that I attend. It's not in my everyday real surgical life, parenting life, student, going to school life. Who are we doing life with that makes all the difference in the world? Write this down. Right across the top of your communication card, just flip it over. It's our one big thing. I left a big open portion today for you to write your own notes. Normally we do a lot of fill in. Today I'm going to give you some freedom. But write this down across the top. Courage comes through companionship. That's where it comes from. I was bold and I was courageous when I was with Zach. Life feels differently when you're doing it with the right people. It feels differently when you're convinced that God is with you. If you're convinced of that, that wherever you go, your commute to work, going to therapy, going to family events, going into a difficult meeting that you don't want to have, but you know you need to have it. If you are convinced that God is with you, it makes all the difference. So I want us to learn today from one of my favorite people in the Bible. This is a very personal story for me, and I want us to get into this. This is Joshua 1, 6 through 9. If you brought your Bible, bust it open. Phone, turn it on. We're a phone-friendly church. Do a post, take a picture, use the Bible app. This is Joshua chapter 1, verse 6. So I want you to think about this question. Where do you find courage? Maybe you find it in your station of life. Maybe you find it from your portfolio or from your career. Maybe you find it from your network, from degrees, from success or people knowing that you've had success. Where do you find courage, real courage, in this life? I want us to look at Joshua. I think we're going to see an explosion of truth when God's story intersects our story. So this is Joshua. I'm going to read. Let's read this scripture, and then we'll look at the big picture and zoom in on the small picture here to understand how it can connect to our life. This is Joshua chapter 1. Be strong and courageous. Everybody say, be strong. We need it stronger. Everybody say, be strong. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Are you picking up a theme yet? Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Verse 9. Are we picking up a theme yet? Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. If you truly believe that. It changes your worldview. If you truly believe that the Lord God Almighty, the same sovereign God that spoke and created all the things, the same God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead through the power of the Holy Spirit, that spirit lives inside of you. If you truly believe that God is with you, when you go into the most difficult of circumstances, you're not alone. In fact, I believe 
that God goes there before we do, that he paves the way, that he directs our paths, that he makes our paths straight. When we walk through that difficult door into that difficult conversation, God has already been at work in our heart, in their heart, paving the way, preparing for that moment. I believe that God goes before us, and I believe that God is with us all the time. So Joshua, thousands and thousands, long time ago, Okay, long time ago. How many of you have heard of Moses, the Ten Commandments? Can I see a hand if you've heard of Moses, Ten Commandments? Moses, Ten Commandments. So let's go back. So this is Joshua. This is God talking to Joshua, but let's zoom out and see the big picture. Let's rewind from this scripture about 40-ish years. Go back. So Joshua would have been a young guy. I'm picturing him maybe like in his 20s. Go back about 40 years from this scripture. Moses was leading the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage and slavery. Joshua was a young guy growing up in the ranks of leadership with Moses leading, being the steward of millions and millions of Jewish people who were coming out of slavery. Okay, remember, Moses is the guy, crazy miracles, right? Like Moses extends the rod, right? Red Sea parts. So you're Joshua. You're going to follow up this guy later. Imagine that. You're going to follow that guy. Joshua is growing up, coming out of Egypt. They come out. They're getting closer and closer to this land that God had promised them, hence the name Promised Land. And Moses kind of does this secret agent, spy, 007, Jewish edition And he selects some guys to go into the promised land early and check it out, spy it out. Like, go in, do some covert recon, come back, report, let us know what's up with this. So Joshua would have been a young guy at this time with other men who go in and they check it out. They come back, and Joshua is one of the only guys who's like, they're huge. The enemies look like a bunch of Shaquille O'Neal's. They're massive, but I'm telling you, The fruit is amazing, kale, scrumptious, all the things we could ever need. It's a beautiful land. We need to go in there. We need to fight. We can take these guys. Let's go in and take them. And everybody else was so intimidated by the size of their enemies that because of that good report, they loved Joshua so much that they wanted to basically stone him to death. This is where the children of Israel were. So out of that moment, you read in a book called Numbers 14.29. Yes, God is good in accounting. He has his own book called Numbers. It says this, because of this unbelief, right, because of this unwillingness to go into the land that God had promised them, this is written. God is saying the carcasses, this is hardcore, the carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness, What God is saying is because this generation chose not to believe me to go in and to take this land, to go in and fight, to go in and trust me, remember, courage, to go in knowing that God would go before them, to go in knowing that, yes, the enemy is big, but their God is bigger, that it said, no, we can't believe that, God can't do that, God says that generation has to die before we move forward. So an entire generation of people died. Wandering around the desert for 40 years. And if you think about that, some of these same principles still apply today. Sometimes in life, before you can move forward, there are certain things that need to die. Before you go on to the next step, maybe there's some fear in you that needs to die. Maybe there's some insecurity in you that needs to die. Maybe there's a self-sufficient or humanistic flavoring inside of you that needs to die. Maybe you need to come to a complete position of dependence on God before he blows that next door open for you. Just like a generation died before they could go into the promised land, maybe there's something in your heart or in your life that needs to die before you can move forward in God. Just be wandering around. Still wondering why stuff's not working. Well, I go to church every once in a while. I mean, I have a Bible. I read some things, but I never change my behavior. Wandering around. So Joshua, remember this, has 
almost already been killed for the idea of going into the promised land. You understand that? When he was like in his 20s, they wanted to stone him to death, beat him to death with rocks. So about 40 years rolls around, and now God wants to use him to lead some of the same people into some of the same places that they wanted to kill him for 40 years ago. You know, it takes a special kind of courage to try something scary for the first time. Is that true? Like the first time you ever skydived, the first time you ever bungee jumped, the first time you ever had kids. <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen. Nobody gives you a binder that tells you all the things that you need to do. You just have one, and you figure it out. But it takes an even deeper, special kind of courage to try something again for the second time. when the first one almost killed you. So are you putting yourself in Joshua's position? Now the Lord is telling him, I want you to be strong. I want you to be courageous. <sighs> Why is this? I think Joshua is very similar to us. Joshua was a young emerging leader. Joshua had more responsibility for more humans than we will ever have responsibility for. And I think Joshua was scared. Do you see God getting mad at him for being scared? How dare you? Don't you know who you serve, you little weakling? I think Joshua was stressed out. I can't believe, after all these years, you're going to sit there and stress out about me being able to do this. I thought you had faith, Joshua. Pop. No, God doesn't do that. When Joshua is stressed, and when Joshua is fearful, and when Joshua is insecure about the future and has more leadership responsibility than he has ever had in his life, what does God do? He reminds him of his presence. Be strong. Be courageous. How? How? For the Lord your God will be with you. That's how. Because it's not just your personality. It's not just your strengths. It's not just your giftedness. It's not just your skill set. It is your creator that is walking life with you that makes the difference. This is what he's reminding Joshua of. And this is what he would remind us of today. Today is Commitment Sunday. There are some of us in this room, we're going to make financial commitments to build a permanent home. This is our starting line today. It's not the finish line. But it's going to take courage to make the kind of commitments that God wants us to give. God doesn't want us to give something that we know we can give, that'd be easy to give, that doesn't change our lifestyle, that doesn't encourage us to pray anymore. God doesn't need that. He's calling you to give something that depends on him. See, that's the thing about life. God will never call you to do something that you can do on your own. You don't need God for that. He will only call you to do things that are God-sized things, which is why it's okay to feel pressure, why it's okay to feel insecure, why it's okay to feel a little bit fearful at times, because it can't just depend on you. That's why we have faith. That if God doesn't show up, this thing is going to fail. That if God doesn't show up at your surgery, in your business, in your family, in Go Church, today, building a home, we need to be doing things where if God does not show up, it will be an epic failure. That's when you know you're in the zone of faith. I'm telling you, that will make sure your prayer life is hopping. So this is where Joshua is. So I want you to think about this idea of pressure. How many of you have ever felt pressure? Stress, pressure, yeah. Pretty normal. I've been feeling some of that. You know, I always want to be a great pastor, always want to be perfect pastor, make great decisions, all this building and financial decisions and timeline things, making sure we do the right thing at the right time. You know, I feel pressure. You feel pressure. I think sometimes we see pressure as something inappropriate 
or something that we shouldn't feel. I used to feel that way about it. It's like when people would ask me when I speak at other things or here, it's like, do you get nervous when you speak? And I switched a long time ago from feeling nervous to feeling excited. I don't feel nervous. I feel excited, excited about what God's going to do. I feel an energy. I want to get out there. I want to serve. I, I want to share what God's put on my heart. So I don't see it as nervousness. I see it as excitement. I see pressure the same way. Sometimes stress and pressure is the reminder that we need to pray and to seek God and to say, God, I can't do this on my own. God, I need you. That's the signal in your body saying, hit your knees and pray and ask God to show up. Pray and say, God, if you don't show up, this is going to be an epic failure. Blessed is the person who's poor in spirit, which means blessed is the person that knows their need for God. Do you know that? How much you need him. The created need that he has put in you. But we feel pressure. And I felt like God impressed my heart, and I wrote this down, and I want to share this with you today. Maybe write this down. I wrote, I feel that God is saying to us today, feel the pleasure of what I have called you today. Let me say that again. Feel the pressure. Let me say that again. Feel the pleasure of what I have called you to do, not just the pressure of what I have called you to do. That God is wanting to restore a level of smile and a level of pleasure and a level of excitement in the middle of pressure that you feel in life. Pressure is not evil. It's a reminder that we need God. Courage comes through companionship. This verse to me is very, very personal. I'll share with you three or four things that actually happened just in my life with this verse. So I'm going all the way back to high school. I was praying about what college to go to. I grew up in Oklahoma, and I grew up in a small church, and it was a Sunday night. I grew up, we had church Sunday night, Sunday morning, Wednesday night, every night. I don't know. It just seemed like we went to church all the time. Every night was good to have church. So Sunday night, we're doing church, and they have a time for prayer. Old school, they call it altar call. So I went down, and I was praying. I was trying to figure out where do I going to go to school. And I was going to go to either University of Oklahoma or Oklahoma State University. I was just trying to pray about what to do. It felt very stressful for me at that time. It's, it's easy to forget, adults, that when students are in high school, we have many students here today, it's more stressful than we remember. We kind of think, oh, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. It's a big deal when you're in it, trying to figure out relationships and future and what to do. So I, I'm there and I'm praying about it, and I'm crying and praying. And my mom had come down. I didn't know this, and she laid her hand on me, and she brought her Bible. She had to pray for me because I had an awesome mom, and she read Joshua one six through nine to me. And it was just a word at the right time, at the right place. God reminding me, be strong and courageous because wherever you go, I'll be with you. You're not going alone. You're not going by yourself. So it wasn't so much about the decision. It was about remembering that God is with me. And I decided to go to the University of Oklahoma because I'm a Christian. So (laughs) so I go to OU. So I'm at OU. It's my sophomore year. I'm praying about what to do, you know, post-graduation, what to really focus in on for major. I had some ideas, but I didn't really know. It was a very powerful night for me, my sophomore year, by myself in prayer where I felt God had called me to ministry. And God brought that verse back to my memory again. I had old school printed it off and made it into a poster and did some like 90s design on it and laminated it and had it like in my dorm room. And God brought that verse back to my heart. I said, I'm with you. I feel like God called me into ministry that night, fast forward in time. Becky and I get married, and we are moving down to Louisiana State University to start college student ministry for the very first time as missionaries. And we go to a church, and we didn't know anybody in this church but the senior pastor. This was probably going to be the church that we were going to attend while we were in Baton Rouge. 
And the pastor asked me and Becky to come down, and he wants the elders and the leaders of the church just to pray for us. It's like our first night, our first Sunday in town, you know. So we come down, and there's like five or six elders that come down. This kind of sounds like a weird word. It's just older people who really love Jesus who have wisdom. That's what elders are. So they come down. They're praying for us, and it was good. It was a good moment. And then one guy... He was kind of like in front of me. He looks me in the eye. I don't know if anybody's like looked you in the eye, gives you that kind of, kind of that weird prophetic eye, like something's about to happen. So he looks at me, and I'm like, and he doesn't blink. He's like Joshua one nine. He walks off. <laughs> Think about how that felt to me, though. Very first time in a new town, new ministry, didn't know anybody. What was God doing? God was reminding me, I'm with you. Do this. We got it. You can do it. And then fast forward 14 years, and Becky and I are still doing university student ministry, and we're feeling a call of God to start a new church. We're trying to pray about where to start a new church. Becky says, what about Denver? We start to explore the idea of starting a church in Denver. We're living in Oklahoma at the time. We had never really been through Denver, vacationed here, none of that stuff. We didn't know any humans here. We're like, well, okay, that would be kind of a stretch, but we're praying about it. So we decide to plan a trip to Denver. And in the 90 days preceding this trip, I decided I'm going to read the entire Bible through. I'm going to fast. I'm going to pray, not to twist God's arm, but to help me be able to be sensitive to his voice. That's what praying and putting yourself in the word does. It doesn't change God, it changes you. We go to the only church in Centennial of the, any pastor that I knew at that time, Terry, and we go to this church, and we decide we're going to be extra Christian-y and stay for both worship experience times. I'm going to maximize the opportunity for God to speak to me. So the first one was kind of depressing because I didn't feel like anything happened. I'm like, well, I mean, it was good and stuff, but nothing real overt. We're praying about what to do, where to go. Is Denver right? So second worship experience rolls around, and Terry gets on the microphone. And most churches, you know, when you do multiple worship experiences, they're the same. It's the same song, same message, all that stuff. So I'm like, well... Second verse, same as the first, probably. Well, Terry gets up and he grabs the microphone and he goes, this morning, God woke me up early and I have never spoken on this verse. I've never used it, never done a series on it, never preached it here. But I just feel like right now in this moment, we need to look at a scripture. Would you open up your Bibles to Joshua 1, 6 through 9? And... He just begins to exegete out this mini sermon about how Joshua was a young leader, that God had called him to do something that was bigger than he could do on his own. Think about how this is feeling to me and Becky. Becky's standing by me, digging her nails into my forearm like a tiger. (laughs) Do you hear what he's saying? And she's starting to cry, and I'm starting to get emotional, and he just keeps going on how Joshua was willing to trust God into new places and into new things. Things that he couldn't do on his own. Methods that would be abstract and loony. Things that God would ask him to do that would not make any sense to a logical person to do. (laughs) In some ways, that's a good definition of ministry. And I'm sitting there, and I really feel like God is saying, once again, It's time to take a step. This is a land you've never been, but it's been my land for a long time. And I want to do something special. And so here we are today. And we've grown from our family to this and more. And God has done something amazing here. But I want us to be an ever-growing community of courageous Christians who don't bend our knee to cultural pressures, who don't bend our knee to what culture says we should do or not do, but who boldly stand up and say, I am going to stand up for the word of God. 
I'm going to love everything every person the way that God has called me to love them. I'm going to serve them in every way, but it's not my job to convict them, and it's not my job to save them, and it's not my job to heal them. It's my job to love and serve them and point them to the one who can, and that is Jesus Christ, God's one and only son. But what God has called us to do in building this building is going to take courage. Courage! Not giving things that's easy to give, not giving last and leftover, but giving first and best always sacrificing for two years to say, God, this is you. I'm going to give everything I can give, not just financially, but in my time, in my emotions, in my attitude, in my willingness to serve. And God is going to blow doors open for you. Not just for us as a church, but for you. Giving is something that God wants for you. Courage comes through companionship. God gives Joshua a key to being prosperous and successful. Wave your hand at me if you would like to be successful. Can I see a a wave? Yes. All my kids waved. I'm glad. (laughs) You want to be prosperous. You want to be successful. I want to share with you a key that God told David, excuse me, that God told Joshua right here in this scripture about how to be successful and prosperous. And it's this, Joshua 1.8. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. You want to be prosperous and successful? Work it backwards. Start there. Work backwards. What do you need to do? You need to expose yourself to the Bible. Not to just read it, to meditate on it, to let it bother you. We don't go to the Bible and change the Bible. We go to the Bible and the Bible changes us. He says, if you want to be prosperous and successful, keep this book of the law always on your lips. What that means is never stop talking about it. Always be talking about the truth And the word of God, never let it stop coming out of your mouth. So there is this idea of talking about it, it coming out of your life. And then you see, meditate on it day and night. So there's this inside part and there's this outside part. So maybe write this down, to meditate. Of course, it means what you think it means, to ponder to devise, to muse, to imagine. Richard Foster, an author, says this about meditation, an intense intimacy and awful reverence. Meditation means you allow the word of God space to bother you. It is you seeing yourself as metal that is plunged into the forge of God. It comes out, and it's that anvil and that hammer of the Word of God, the Spirit of God, the Word of God, and the Spirit of God, hammering us, shaping us, creating us into a weapon, into a tool that God can use to make a difference in this world. So to meditate has this idea, yes, of to ponder, but that's not it. If you continue to look at this and study this word, meditate also means to proclaim. It means to ponder and to proclaim. It literally means to roar like a lion. And you know, sometimes in life, we forget that. We forget that. Many times we see spirituality as this internal thing. It's personal, but it's not private. That's our spiritual walk. And we forget this. Sometimes you think we'll just ponder, we'll just meditate, we'll just journal. There's nothing wrong with that. Powerful spiritual discipline to meditate. But that's not all. He's saying to meditate on the word of God means to ponder it on the inside and to proclaim it on the outside. So, for example, when the devil is up in your face and you are battling a sickness, you can proclaim the word of God. By the stripes on Jesus' back, I am healed. When you are in the middle of fear, you can proclaim the word of God. That God didn't give me a spirit of fear, but one of power and love and a sound mind. When you're feeling alone, 
that Jesus would never leave me. He sticks closer to a brother. When you feel like the devil is in your face and will not leave, the Bible says resist the devil and he will flee. I am telling you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Do you believe that, Go Church? Come on, can we make some noise? Do we really believe that, Go Church? That the one who is in you is greater than any cultural pressure, anything you're going to feel at work, any amount of evil. God is greater. God is bigger. So what? God is reminding Joshua, I am with you, the creator, sovereign God of the universe, and I'm with you. And if God is with you, who can be against you? Make a commitment that's God-sized, not you-sized. And besides that, I don't have anything to say. I close with this, a reminder. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Some of you, my friends and family, you've been in a discouraging time. You can lift your head up in hope because God is with you. That's all you need to know. You're not alone. He'll get you through it. He's with you. He's close to the brokenhearted. I believe that God would have us remember his proximity today and not just his power. He's close to you. He's transcendent and he's intimate at the same time. And he sees your heart and he sees your hurts. And if it's on your mind, it's on his heart. God, I just pray right now for every person in this place an encouragement to wash over them. People who are here who are feeling sad, feeling discouraged, feeling off course, I pray that you would help them just like you helped Joshua, that you would remind them that you are close here today. In Jesus' name. I want everybody to look at me. I was preparing for this message and I came across an interesting kind of fun story. So I want you to go way back. So this is like 1860, okay? There's this guy named Charles Blondin. And he decides, he's a risk taker, he decides in 1860 that he was going to do something that nobody had ever done. Something that nobody had the thought or the guts to try. He was going to string a tightrope all the way across Niagara Falls. He was going to walk across this tightrope. It's 1860, okay? When he could do crazy stuff like this on a whim. No permits to pull. You just go out. I'm just going to go do it. So he does this. And of course, crowds are coming from all over. Canadian side, U.S. side to come see this guy basically die. <laughs> so he decides... You know, I'm going to walk across this tightrope, all these crazy crowds. And so he gets up there and he does it. He makes it. So then he starts to go more extreme and more extreme. This is a true story. I looked it up. I wanted to make sure it was true before I talked about this because it sounded kind of nutso. So he would walk across in like a burlap sack. He walked across on stilts, across Niagara Falls. He walked across blindfolded. I kid you not, he strapped on an oven to his back, went out on the wire, stopped, made a fire in this oven, cooked an omelet, and then lowered it down to his fans. I bet it was good, too. I mean, this guy's crazy. So, of course, his reputation is building, you know, it's just growing into this big phenomenon. And he decides to do something he had never done before. So the crowd's even bigger. You know, he's going across. And he's like, do you think I can go across this tightrope? Pushing a big wheelbarrow. People are like, yeah, you can do it. He's like, okay, well, that's too easy. Do you think I can go across this tightrope? With a person inside of the wheelbarrow. And they're like, you can do it. Come on. And he's like, would anybody like to get in? Look what we have today, the biggest orange wheelbarrow you've ever seen in your whole life. But this is a question I want to pose to you today. 
this is symbolizing our move. And we're going to have an opportunity to do this all through May, but today is our starting line. There's some of you who are come and you've prepared to do this today. Today, we have a wheelbarrow, and it's symbolizing this moment. We've taken our vision. We have strung it across what seems to be an impossible gap. Wow, that's big. Wow, that's expensive. All of the challenges that are connected to this feat that we want to pull off, but we can't do it alone. I want you to get in your mind that it's not Charles, it's the Lord leading us across in this wheelbarrow. Will we get in? Will we trust him? Will we say, you know what, God? I believe you. You're with me. But I'm going to do it. So today is the day that we start this. So when the band starts playing this song, I'm going to go first. Every one of you who are prepared, you brought a commitment card today. You've prayed about this, fasted about this. You've read The Genius of Generosity. You're ready. After I go through, I want you to come up and follow me. And I want you to take your commitment card. I want you to put it right here in this wheelbarrow. And then I want you to walk right over here. Follow me, and I'm going to sign this somewhere, and I want you to sign it somewhere. And then I want you to take a little orange block. I'm going to take my little orange block, and I'm going to put it right in front of my iMac in the office. And it's going to be a little visual reminder for me that it's not just me. I'm one block of many. I'm going to follow and trust God. It's going to be a visual reminder that God is building something that I can't do on my own. So I'm going to pray. And I'm going to put mine in, and as the band plays, I want you to come right in after me. God, I just want to thank you so much for this family, for this team, for the future that you have for us. God, thank you that we don't have to live afraid. We don't have to live discouraged. Why? Because you are with us. To be strong. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God, help us to give courageously. Help us to live courageously. Thanks again for listening to this week's message. To stay in the know with Go Church, be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at letsgo.church. You can also download our app from the App Store by searching Go Church. Have a great week and God bless.